Shalom, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Pulse of Israel here in our and uh, I'm sorry, here in our ancestral and eternal homeland, the land of Israel. And today I am with an author, uh, a lecturer, a professor, an international relations expert, and also a friend. So let us all welcome Emmanuel Navon. Shalom, Emmanuel. Shalom. Great to be here. It is a pleasure having you, and today we are talking about your new book. Want to hold it up so we can all see it? Here we go. The Star and the Scepter, A Diplomatic History of Israel. So first of all, uh, Mazal Tov on your new book. Congratulations. And uh, love to hear all about it. I guess the first question is, what does that mean, a diplomatic history of Israel? What is different about this book than other books written about the history of Israel? And, and I guess you're trying to, 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 to differentiate, differentiate, differentiate yourself exactly by saying that, a diplomatic history of Israel. So go for it. That's right. Well, it's, it's really a book on uh, the foreign policy uh, of Israel. Uh, I've been teaching a class on Israel's foreign policy for many years. Uh, at Tel Aviv University and at the IDC at Tzaliya. And I've realized with time that there's actually no book uh, on that topic, no book on Israel's foreign policy uh, covering all aspects of Israel's foreign policy. So when I decided a few years ago to fill that gap by writing a book on Israel's foreign policy, then when I started writing the book, I said, well, yes, but wait, the, the history of, the, of Israel, of the Jewish people, does not start in 1948. So, you know, if you would write a history of uh, a diplomatic history of, uh, I don't know, Russia or China, uh, you know, you wouldn't start in the uh, 20th century. And so I decided to write a, a diplomatic history, not only of the state of Israel, but of the Jewish people, which is admittedly very ambitious, uh, but I think it was really uh, missing. And that's why I undertook this uh, very ambitious project of uh, analyzing and explaining the relation between the Jews and the world, the nations of the world, not only as the state of Israel since 1948, uh, but also in the Jewish diaspora, uh, the leaders of the Jewish communities, their dealings with foreign leaders during the diaspora, and of course, going back uh, to the ancient kingdoms uh, of Israel. So this is really a 3,000-year uh, history, diplomatic history uh, of the Jewish people and not only of the, uh, of the state of Israel. That is so interesting. So, of course, we want to tell everyone to purchase this book and be able to read for themselves everything you have to write about that. But can you just uh, entertain me? What diplomatic history of Israel uh, can you give across from the biblical stories that you write about? So there are actually uh, three chapters in the book that deal with the uh, no notion of the concept of Israel and the nations in the uh, Hebrew Bible because I think that it is impossible to understand the way the Jews perceive themselves and their role in history and vis-a-vis -vis other nations without uh, understanding uh, the Bible. It's the founding document of, uh, of Judaism and of the Jewish people. And I think the way the Jews perceive themselves and their role in the world cannot be understood uh, without a basic knowledge uh, of, uh, of the Hebrew Bible, uh, which is why I looked into this topic of Israel and the nations in the uh, Hebrew Bible. And the reason why I chose this uh, title, the star and the scepter, uh, is because I took it from a verse from the, uh, uh, the, book, uh, the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 24, verse uh, 17. A star rises from Jacob, a scepter comes forth from Israel. And uh, I think the, uh, the reason why I chose this, uh, this verse is because, as we know in the story of Bilam, when Bilam is basically hired by King Balak to uh, curse the Jewish people, uh, he ends up saying uh, very interesting sentences, some of which are considered blessings. And one of them is really this idea of a star coming out of Jacob and a scepter from Israel. And the central thesis of my book is that if you look at 3,000 years of Jewish history, uh, I claim that the star symbolizes spirituality and uh, uh, roots in history, and the scepter symbolizes temporal power and political power. And I claim that uh, throughout our long history, we've, we've always had this tension uh, between only caring either about our uh, spirituality or only about political power. And I think the secret of our survival 
uh, and, and of the name Israel is to keep a balance between the two, knowing how to defend our, uh, our heritage in the real world, which, by the way, is the whole meaning of the name that Jacob received after fighting the angel. I mean, why is he named Israel or Israel in Hebrew? Uh, because before that, you know, you had Jacob, who uh, was all about spirituality, and him, his twin brother, Esau, who was only Esav in Hebrew, who was only about materiality and strength. And neither of them could really inherit uh, Avram and Yitzchak. And therefore, it's only after Jacob proves his willingness and ability to fight for his, uh, for his spiritual inheritance in the real world that he's uh, given the name Israel. And my last point is that uh, the even after this uh, change of name, uh, the text continues to use both names uh, alternatively. Sometimes it's Israel, sometimes it's Yaakov. It keeps right. changing. And this is not the case for, for example, when Avram becomes Avraham or when Sarai becomes Sarah. That's it. You never hear the former names anymore. And I think the reason for that is that, in fact, Jacob was never fully comfortable with the idea that now his new name was Israel or Israel and that he had to combine between his spirituality and his willingness to fight uh, in the real world. No, that's very interesting. And uh, as someone, I, I personally love uh, studying Tanakh, love studying uh, the prophets. And I've always had an eye for this as well. When studying about the different kings, you see that the struggle is always, the prophets are always telling the kings, well, first of all, get everyone on board with following God. Stop, fo stop following these false idols and stop putting all your belief in foreign powers. Like, yeah, you have to make strategic alliances, but don't put all your eggs in the basket. Don't forget God. That's one of the major, uh, major lessons. And the other thing I always think about as well when thinking about modern times and thinking about how hard it is to be a Jewish leader for the modern state of Israel, I'm also always taking into consideration the biblical stories from of the kings of them having to decide which foreign powers to ally with? Because it was impossible not to ally with any foreign power, and and but but then it was always it it was very it's very much very real politic. Okay, we are surrounded by enemies. Who do we align with in order to protect ourselves? Um, so so you always see that struggle. So I'm very interested in in actually reading your book and seeing how you go into that in more depth. So how would you say modern state of Israel is dealing with this struggle of balancing, connecting to our heritage, as well as playing the geopolitical game, which must be played to survive as a, as a nation state? Right. So I claim in my, in my book that the, the first, I would say the first uh, tests for the Zionist movement after Herzl established uh, the Zionist Congress uh, in 1897, and for the first time, in fact, uh, the members and the representatives of the Zionist Congress became statesmen and diplomats. I, I claim that before that, there was what I call a Jewish diplomacy, where you had leaders of Jewish communities that conducted uh, diplomacy with foreign powers, whether it was a Barbanel or um, other leaders who really also dealt with diplomacy. Uh, but the moment the Zionist movement was officially established, people like Theodor Herzl and Chaim Weizmann became statesmen and diplomats. And I think even before Israel became independent, they were faced very early with a tough choice between political realism or realpolitik in German and national aspirations and ideology on the other hand. I think the first test was when the uh, British Empire offered the Uganda proposal in 1903, uh, when there was an emergency at the time to establish a Jewish state uh, because of the pogroms in Russia. But then, of course, Great Britain didn't rule over the land of Israel and the Middle East. Uh, the Ottomans did, the Turks, and they were allied with Germany. So there was no uh, realistic prospect of establishing a Jewish state then. And when, uh, and when the British offered Uganda and Herzl submitted this proposal uh, to the Zionist Congress, it was a very tough debate between those who uh, advocated political realism, grab whatever reality has to offer right now when there's an emergency, and those who said no. You have to stick to our history and to our past and to our national aspiration. At the end, we know that the Zionist movement, its majority, rejected the Uganda proposal. But then the same dilemma uh, uh, repeated itself a few years later in 1937, uh, when for the first time the British government 
propose to partition its mandate uh, between a Jewish state and an Arab state. Uh, here also, there was an emergency because the Nazis had been in power in Germany for four years already. Uh, the British Empire was restricting uh, Jewish uh, immigration, Jewish aliyah, and purchase of land. Uh, but the, 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 the state proposed by the Peel Commission 937 was tiny. It did not include Jerusalem. Here again, there was a very tough choice that repeated itself in 1947. Uh, uh, today's the 29th of November, uh, the day the United Nations voted for the partition of the British uh, mandate. And here, I think the I think Ben Gurion was very much, uh, very much embodied this uh, very delicate balance between realpolitik and faithfulness to our past. On the one hand, uh, Ben Gurion, even though he was secular, was very much versed into Jewish history. He very much saw Israel as the outcome of Jewish history. The Declaration of Independence proclaims the establishment of a Jewish state uh, in the land of Israel. But on the other hand, he also realized that uh, politically in 1947, the only option uh, for Israel to become independent was to accept uh, the very imperfect plan proposed by the UN. And he also knew, by the way, uh, that even though the borders proposed by the UN in 1947 uh, were far from perfect and did not include Jerusalem, at the end of the day, uh, what would determine the uh, borders of the Jewish state was the war that was declared on us by the Arab League, which was indeed the case. Uh, so I think Ben Gurion very much epitomizes, in my opinion, uh, this successful and very often delicate balance between uh, political realism on the one hand and faithfulness to our history and to our past on the other. So b based on this knowledge and appreciation of, of bridging the two, uh, the, the connection to our heritage as well as real politic, how do you think we are doing in Israel today in raising a new generation of lead political leaders and potential prime ministers to be able to lead, uh, lead us forward in that direction? Look, I think we have to differentiate between the, uh, you know, the leadership that is growing in Israel uh, you know, in, in university and elsewhere, and, and, and elsewhere. And I think one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book, which is also going to be obviously translated into Hebrew, is really to provide young Israelis a wide historical perspective. And again, understand that the history of the Jewish people did not start in 1948, and you cannot lead the uh, diplomacy and foreign policy of the Jewish state without a wide historical perspective and understanding where we come from. So that is, first of all, my purpose. In terms of uh, political leadership uh, in Israel, well, I think there's very much a, a void. Uh, you know, it's a one-man show. It's been a one-man show for more than a decade. And we need uh, new leaders. We need uh, people who are imbued with history. Uh, I think Netanyahu himself, being the son of a historian, is very much aware of the history of the Jewish people. I think it's very clear in his conduct of foreign policy, where, by the way, he's been very successful in foreign policy. Uh, I wouldn't say the same about economic policy or, ju or judicial reform, uh, where he's been less, much less active, uh, unfortunately. But in foreign policy, I think he's been uh, very successful. I think also in balancing uh, between political realism and, uh, and, as I said, faithfulness to our past and to our roots, uh, even though here and there I have some criticism about some foreign policy decisions. But I think uh, globally, uh, uh, in the past years, the... Uh, international standing of Israel has improved dramatically. Uh, and this, all this without mortgaging the, uh, the country's security, uh, as many other leaders did in the past, uh, thinking that in order to improve in Israel's international standing, uh, you would have to gamble on its security with agreements uh, with the PLO. And I think the past few years has proven, have, have proven that this is not the case, that Israel's, as I said, international standing has uh, improved dramatically uh, without mortgaging the uh, the country's uh, security. Oh, very important insight. And it's interesting, this is sort of going on an aside, but another thing that I've taken away by being, trying to be the best student as possible of, of the Torah and Tanakh and, 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 and the prophets, when you read through these stories about the different kings, even King David or, or King, so not as much King Solomon, but definitely King David and mostly every other king, it's not just about the foreign policy, it's about the internal palace intrigue where there is you're constantly battling infighting from your own even trusted advisors trusted generals who all of a sudden turn on the kings and sometimes that that touches a chord with me when i think about uh current politics as well where even with my own critique of netanyahu or certain politicians or certain governments 
I'm always taking a step back and see, and, and thinking to myself, oh my God, look how much internal politics has to be done to try to overcome internal opposition, not only from other parties, but from your own party in order to just try to do what you were elected to do, even before getting to foreign policy or instituting any policy. There's just so many hurdles to jump over within internal politics in order to succeed. Um, I don't know if you touch upon that in your book as well, but that certainly comes to mind as well as leadership. It's not just about being a leader, a successful leader on the world stage. It's how you handle the multitude of challenges within your in internal politics to just be able to do anything, forget about being successful. Yeah, it's true, by the way, not only of Israel, but as you say, it's true that if you, when you look at the Tanakh and you see all the internal politics, and, and the Tanakh is very honest about all these uh, internal politics, you know, you, it tells all the stories, you know, and, and, uh, and I go through my books through many of those stories about, uh, you know, intrigues in the palace and, uh, and power struggles, uh, not only uh, internationally, but domestically. So in a way, there's nothing new about this. And, and I guess every leader has to deal with this. But I think the fact, you know, very, I mean, Israel is, is, is a parliamentary democracy. And by nature, when you are a parliamentary democracy, uh, you have to always find compromise with the different parties uh, that may make up your government. But even when you uh, only have one party in your government, I mean, you know, uh, this uh, last week actually marked the... Uh, 30th anniversary of the political defenestration of Margaret Thatcher, who was, in my mm. opinion, the, one of the best prime ministers in, 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 in British history. I mean, she was a, a woman of courage, of principles, uh, who, uh, who uh, improved the economic and international standing of Britain. And yet, uh, you know, at the last minute, uh, the moment she was considered a, an electoral liability uh, by the Conservative Party, uh, they basically uh, got rid of her. And that is politics in a parliamentary democracy, as opposed to a presidential system uh, where you have election every uh, X years, uh, four years in America, and then you, 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 you pretty much set, you know, you have your uh, four years in, in government, even though you can lose your majority every so often uh, in Congress, but that is also the nature of a parliamentary democracy. Well, uh, Emmanuel, we need everyone to buy this book in order to be better educated and more intrigued about Jewish history and how it applies to, to modern uh, the modern state of Israel as well. It's, so it's what's your final plug to get people to go out and buy it? Yes, absolutely. It's available on, uh, on Amazon. And I look forward to, uh, to read the feedback uh, of people uh, and they're welcome to also ask me questions on email and social media. And I'm happy to continue uh, this conversation and, and really thank you uh, to you, Avi, for uh, uh, for this uh, session and for this interview. It's my pleasure. Please send me the link where we can post so that people people can be able to, to to click and purchase it. I very much look forward to reading it myself. I'm very intrigued. Obviously, you hear how you, you know my interest in politics. Now you hear about my interest in the Tanakh and the and the prophets and the Bible. So you really, it sounds like you really bring bring the two together. So th this seems like a, a a home run, as we say in uh, in American English. For me, uh, in terms of a book, <laughs> but uh, yeah, congratulations on the new book, Emmanuel, Thank and uh, with everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Avi. Pleasure. And everybody, once again, thank you for joining for another episode of the Pulse of Israel. Hope you enjoyed today's uh, session with Emmanuel Navon, author of The Star and the Scepter. Please click on the link that I will be paste, uh, posting so you can uh, also purchase this for yourself. And stay safe, stay healthy, everyone. Signing off from the eternal and ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. Take care and shalom. Pulse of Israel, frontline videos from the Holy Land. Support our work by donating today.